Stop me if you've heard this one before. Trades are dangerous. Trades are unsafe. My problem with this is this type of rhetoric typically comes from those that don't work in a skilled trade. So why don't we ask tradespeople how safe trades are? Better yet, why don't we ask an occupational health and safety inspector with the Ministry of Labor how safe the trades are? It's time we get to the bottom of this. Let's talk about it. My guest today is a 309A construction and maintenance electrician by trade and worked out of the IBEW local in Niagara. He also worked out of local 804 in Kitchener and local 353 in Toronto. Between 2004 and 2006, the Ministry of Labour hired 200 inspectors. This is when my guest applied and he has worked out of the London office ever since. I'd like to welcome to the show today, Dan Dignard. Thanks for joining us today, Dan. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thanks, Nick. Nice to see you again. The first question I want to ask right off the top is, is a two-part question. And it's the term inspector. What does that actually mean? And could you give a brief description of the roles and responsibilities associated with this position? So as an inspector with the Ministry of Labor, I'm, uh, I'm designated as a provincial offenses officer. And uh, I enforce the Occupational Health and Safety Act and the construction regs and any other regs associated with the act in workplaces in the province. So my job is to make sure that job sites are safe or workplaces are safe and that people are working safely. You worked in the skill trades before becoming an inspector. Can you provide some of that backstory and what made you want to pursue this current role that you're in? Yeah, so I am a 309A electrician. Uh, I worked in Niagara out of the electrical hall down there. And, um, you know, love working in the trades, love working on the tools. Obviously, I'm here because I think the trades are a fantastic opportunity for our youth that unfortunately gets overlooked sometimes. Um, but, you know, fun working in the trades, loved doing it, got to build some really interesting things, you know, worked in automotive sector, built a casino in the falls, um, worked at universities, doing big additions there. So loved working on the tools, building, you know, facilities and plants. And, and it was just a lot of fun. So great money to be made, good benefits, just, just good, really good work and, and a great career path for our youth. Uh, unfortunately, Niagara went away from uh, industry, right? We clo they closed two GM plants. They closed a Ford glass plant. A lot of the industry disappeared, and it became a bedroom community to Toronto and just tourism industry. So a, a lot of the infrastructure was gone. So the work was drying up for somebody like myself working in the heavy ICI sector. There wasn't a lot of work. So I was working out of the Kitchener local or the Toronto local on projects in those areas. And I had small kids at home and, you know, it's tough being on the road when your kids are young. Right. Right. You know that. Right. So it uh, at that point, the ministry was hiring uh, in 2004 to 2006 to increase the inspector numbers by about 20 percent as part of a commitment to reduce workplace injuries. So I applied and I actually did my interviews with the Ministry of Labor while I was working the afternoon shift at Ford in Oakville on a shutdown. And, um, you know, a couple months after I did my interviews, I got offered a job and they offered me a location in London as opposed to Hamilton or St. Catherine, something in the Niagara area. And uh, I took it and moved family and haven't looked back. I'm in my 17th year with the Ministry of Labor now and I love the job. That's amazing. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It, uh, it was quite an opportunity. And a lot of that was sparked off of meeting uh, a Minister of Labor inspector on a job site I was on at a power and generating station on the Welland Canal system, you know, had a chance to talk to the inspector, saw what the inspector was doing, and he left an impression. And, and when the opportunity came up and, and we noticed the job ad in the paper, I went, you know what, might as well try need to do have something steady and need to have something to take care of my family and, and didn't want to be traveling all the time. Skilled trades and those that work in them have always had an unfair and incorrect stereotype associated with them. Do inspectors face these same challenges? 
And if so, what is being done to think about them? I, I don't think that I get that kind of negative feel because, you know, there's public's perception of what the Ministry of Labor does. We have, they have a certain perception of it. Um, you know, there's a lot of people that think the trades aren't meaningful work that, you, you know, only people that can't go to college or university go into the trades. But, you know, I went to university. My son, who's an apprentice, went to university. Um, there's a lot of really smart people. You know, I worked with a lot of certified electronic technicians that became electricians because it was a continuation for them or electricians that have become engineers. You know, there's a lot of really smart people in all the trades. It doesn't matter what trade you're in. There are so many smart people. It's not a question of intelligence. It's a question of what kind of work do you like to do? Right. Some people are suited to sit in an office. The people that get into the trades like seeing different things, like doing different kinds of activities and don't want to get stuck behind a desk. And, and that's the benefit of working in the trades in addition to the money and the benefits and the opportunities to see things you wouldn't see sitting in an office. Mm -hmm. Those are some excellent points. What does a typical day in your position look like? So for me, right, I turn my computer on every morning, turn my phone on. Uh, respond to any emails or phone calls that need to be responded to. And then the rest of my day is based off of priority. So my first responsibility is if there's been an accident or a complaint to deal with those first. Once, if I don't have any accidents or complaints to deal with, then there's no follow up or continue investigations to do. I generate my inspections of workplaces based off of notices of project and driving by locations. So if I'm driving around, you know, and I'm maybe on my way to a job site that I want to check out, and it's typically based off of, excuse me, scope of the work and, and the hazards that might be associated with the job. So, you know, heavy, heavy industrial or construction jobs, I might have preference to go to as opposed to strictly going to residential projects. Um, so if I'm, but if I'm driving around and I see something, so what we would call a drive by, you right. know, I drive, I'm driving down the street, I see guys working on a swing stage on the side of a building that I don't have a notice of project for. All right, I move all cranes on a job site and I see the crane in the air and they're lifting something. You know, I'll stop at those too. So, so priority is accidents and investigations based off of complaints and, and contact with first responders, right? So the police or fire department would call us if there's been an accident that they attend. And then from there, it's proactive work where I'm, I'm doing it based off of notices of project and drive-bys. So before we go any further, I have three types of tarts today. One is a standard butter tart with pecan. The second is a maple bacon tart. And the third tart is a chocolate with chipotle seasoning inside it. So you're free, you, you are free to pick whatever one you want. We'll start with the non-normal chocolate one first and see how it goes. Oh, you're just, you're just going to go for it? Oh, yeah, now. we're going to dig in. Might as well try the worst one first, right? A little bit of heat. A little bit of heat. Not bad. A little bit of smoke. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I from the Chipotle. I can say I'm probably not the biggest fan of that one. Not as bad as it could have been. That's true. It wasn't it could, bad. Like, it could always be worse. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was curious how they returned. It was my first time making tarts. I've never made a shell before, so they're pretty no, flaky. No, shell, shell's good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're pretty flaky. I like it. Can you describe the difference between a proactive visit and a reactive visit for the viewers today? Yeah, so like I had explained earlier in regards to how I plan my day, uh, a proactive visit is a visit where I'm using notice as a project or coming upon something, some work going on in construction, and I stop and visit. So I'm there just to see what's going on. I might have seen a hazard or seen something not being done safely, like a traffic protection plan, and, and the signs might not have been set up properly. And I'm stopping and proactively visiting them. And, and typically, if it's a residential project or a, uh, a heavy construction project, whether it's a high rise or a factory, I'm stopping by to take a look at all the work that's going on to see how the work's being done, to see if they're following the Occupational Health and Safety Act and the construction regs. And, and then depending what kind of work it is from there, you know, there might be confined space or traffic protection plans or other things I'm looking at as well. So those, so those, are, those are proactive visits where I just show up, I look at something, or I, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the whole project. 
a reactive investigation is based off of a complaint like um, you know a member of the public's called in a complaint about an employer and about unsafe work conditions or workers not wearing PPE like their hard hats and their safety boots are not being tied off um, Reactive is also work refusals, so whether it's at a, a job site or an industrial establishment, and then the uh, the critical injuries and the fatalities. Right. Right. So a worker's been injured or a worker's passed away, um, and those are either called in by the constructor, the employer, or typically by a first responder. So the police service or the fire department would call us. I see. Those are the bad ones. The product, the proactive ones are great. You know, some of the reactive ones are okay, but the critical injury fatalities are the worst part of my day. I would imagine during the proactive visit too, is it's the one of the best opportunities to help educate people on the job yeah. site as well, right? Well, in a proactive visit, you actually get to check everything out at the job site as opposed to being there for something specific like you right. are in a reactive. You're there looking at something specific or investigating something. So it's a different kind of visit. The atmosphere and the mood is different too. And, and you know, quite frankly, right, if somebody's been hurt or somebody's died, right, it's it's not a pleasant visit no, of course for not. anybody, whether for me or for the people involved. So it's it's more somber occasion. Whereas if you're there on a on a proactive visit, you know, you get to check everything out. You get to talk to people. You get to, you know, talk to them about what they're doing. And, and that those are the jobs where I get a chance to talk to the to the young apprentices and the right. young kids in the trade, you know, about what they're doing, how they're liking it, what year of school have they done yet or not, you know, and, and, and really get to talk to people and just build relationships. Right. Cause that's part of what it's about for me is I want to talk to people on the job sites and give them whatever information I can so that they can work safely. And if they have questions moving forward, they can feel free to call me. Right. right? I'm, I'm just another set of eyes on the job site to try to help out and, I have people calling me that have been calling me for like 15, 16 years, right? To ask questions about legislation or what should they do, you know? So right. I like to build those relationships. I, I got to say, I've ran into hundreds of inspectors <clears throat> over my years in the trade, and I've never had a bad conversation with an inspector. It's, it's been great. Well, we're here to help, right? And, and we're, particularly for me, I'm trying to destroy that stereotype that an inspector's, oh, the bad guy. Right. Well, you know, if you're, if you're trying to work safely and then you miss something, We'll point it out to you, right? We're another set of eyes. We're not working in that environment all the time. So we have a different lens we're using. Right. And and for those employers and those workers that want help, we're there to help. Mm -hmm. Right? Some of the, some of the employers aren't good and they don't want us on their sites because they're not maybe working safely. That's different, right? But right. for the most part, people want to work safe. They want to go home at the end of the day. For sure. Absolutely. Now you touched on the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Yes. I'm wondering why it was created and when was it introduced? So in the 1970s, um, there, the, the mining sector had a lot of injuries and a lot of deaths, a lot of exposures to chemicals and occupational illness. And um, they started doing wildcat strikes. And, and I get to get the details correct here just to make sure I'm giving, giving kudos to the right people. So... Um, in 1974, the uranium miners at Elliott Lake were, you know, concerned about lung cancer and silicosis and actually started a 14-day wildcat strike, which, because of the wildcat strike, prompted uh, the Ontario Premier Bill Davis to ask an engineer and university administrator by the name of James Ham to lead a commission on health and safety of workers in ur uranium mines. Um, so the commission focused on two uranium mines, uh, Elliott Lake and Bancroft. And, uh, and then he submitted his report in, 19, in June of 1976. So, you know, basically the internal responsibility system and the Occupational Health, Health and Safety Act were, were created because of the Ham Commission and the recommendations that came out of it. And, and they're the reason why we have the Occupational Health and Safety Act that we do today. Right. What are the three rights of the workers under the Occupational Health and Safety Act and what are the duties of workers? So every worker, every, you know, whether you're a, a worker, a supervisor, an employer, right? Every, every worker has a right to know about the hazards in the workplace, a right to participate in joint health and safety committees and dialogues on how to do the work, and a right to refuse unsafe work. 
Okay. Okay. Well, every every worker has a duty to work safe and to follow direction from their employer. Right. And wear the PPE that their employer wants them to wear or requires them to wear. So, you know, high-vis clothing, hard hats, safety boots. Um, if there's additional things like respirators because of the kind of work they're doing they need to wear or Tyvek suits or something, that's what they need to wear. Right. Right. They also, all workers, and whether you're a worker, a supervisor, a foreman, the owner of a company, you also have a right if you see, or sorry, you have a duty, not right. a right, a duty to report anything unsafe that you see to somebody. Right. So, you know, if it's, I see you working unsafely and I, I come over and say something to you, right? That I've reported it to you or made you aware of it to hopefully prevent you from doing it and getting hurt. Right. Right. If you don't stop doing that, and it's something I'm concerned about, I would go to your supervisor and mention something, right? My responsibility at that point is done, but I need to report it to somebody. I need to bring, if I'm aware of the hazard, make them aware of it. And, and quite frankly, we have a right to each other, you know, responsibility to each other to make sure we're safe and we go home at the end of the day. So I, I can't imagine why anybody wouldn't mention something to somebody if they see them doing something unsafe to try to get them to stop doing that or to, or to correct that action. That's, a, that's an excellent point. <clears throat> And it kind of leads into my next question. You, you mentioned everyone plays a part in safety, and it's not just the inspector's job to make sure people are working safe. And you mentioned previously the IRS. Yes. I'm wondering if you can explain that acronym and what that concept means for the viewers. So the internal responsibility system is what IRS is. So that, that basically lays out each person's role and responsibility. And it's defined in the Occupational Health and Safety Act, right? Duties of a worker, duties of a supervisor, duties of an employer, duties of a supplier, duties of an owner, right? They're duties that are laid out in the act. So the whole idea with an internal responsibility system is, is that Ministry of Labor inspectors are a check and balance on the system. We're there to audit, mm -hmm. right? We're there to do inspections. We want the internal responsibility system to work in a workplace when we're not there. Right. Right. So you have workers' trades committees, joint health and safety committees. You have, you know, workers, supervisors, employers that should be all working together to make the workplace safe. And that's where that whole hierarchy of as a worker, I see something that's unsafe or I've been asked to do something that's unsafe. I go to my supervisor. My supervisor sees me doing something unsafe. They come over and correct it, you know, or they report it if it continues to report it to HR or whoever, but there's that whole check and balance in place to make sure that we're following the act and the regulations that are appropriate for that workplace and that workers are safe and go home at the end of the day. We might as well dig into another set of these uh, tarts. Now. Sure. You get so to pick this one. I'm going to, I'm going to try the bacon. Okay. I'm yeah. Give the bacon. I'm interested this in might be bacon. a little runny. Yeah. Runny is always good. That's like, I, I heard a butter is supposed to be runny. So, Salt and sweet are always good together. Mm -hmm. So, and smoking in there with the bacon too. That's, oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that. I would definitely make that one again. It's now time for some bonus content with Dan. What is your favorite part about being an inspector? Oh, like I've kind of alluded to already is talking to the kids, right? Um, talking to the apprentices on the job site, checking out what work is being done on the job sites. I really like going somewhere and seeing a process that I haven't seen before, right? So a, a new new form of, of floor installation or a new panel system for walls or a new course lab or, or something different, right? So right. in this job, you know, I worked in ICI sector in Niagara. So I did automotive, universities, schools, power generating plants, things like that, mm -hmm. casinos. But... Out of this London office working for the Ministry of Labor, I deal with the nuclear sector. I deal with the petroleum industry down in Sarnia and that, that I never dealt with. So I get to see some really neat stuff. I get to see, you know, cranes that come in 90 boxcars that Mammut has that they're using at Bruce. Right. Right. I get to see the giant cranes down in the valley. I get to see processes I never got to see before. So, you know, talking to people on job sites and, you know, find out where people are from and what trade they're in and seeing some of those processes and all the different toys. That's the best part of my job. I bet, I bet it would be. And that's with me in my experience too, that's one of the greatest things is experiencing different projects 
and seeing some of the technology out there, the different applications. Yeah. And from one day to the next, it can change dramatically. And that's what I love. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was, and that for me, that was part of the fun of being in the trades is being on a job site and watching that job site progress from, from, you know, from, from the excavation in the ground to the final project, right. And see, seeing that final product and saying, Hey, I helped to build that mm -hmm. to me, that was great. Yeah. Right. Because then you drive by it afterwards and, and you go, I was involved in that. Right. So whether it's a casino or a, a line in a factory or something, it was always neat to do that. I don't think there's ever been a trace person in the history of trades that hasn't said proudly, I worked on that project or I was at that project yeah. at some point. I was there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, for sure. You shared with me that you enjoy all types of music minus new rap and new country. It's the long weekend. You're at the fire pit. Which artist are you choosing to chat with for the night and why? Oh, wow. Live or dead or does it matter? It's up to you. Oh, my goodness. That's a tough question. That is really <laughs> a tough question. I mean, it could be Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. It could be Stevie Ray Vaughan. Dizzy Gillespie. It, you know, wow. You're, you're digging deep into the archives. Here. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, <laughs> you know even Adele or, or, you know, um, Bruno Bieber? Mars, Justin Bieber. Yeah, I guess so too. But I think <laughs> like, I mean, you, you, you know, Gaga, like, I mean, there's so many talented artists and there's so many talents that have been around and that are, that are here presently. I, I don't know if I could just pick one, right. I guess it would, I think it would be really dependent on my mood that night, what I was really into, right? If I was into a listening to, to classical music kind of mood, if I was like listening into, you know, a little funk, a little soul or some jazz or, or just some easy listen, you know, I don't, I don't know. Like, I, I don't think you have enough time in a podcast for me <laughs> to pick just one. Oh man. If I were to just pick one. Mm, my goodness. Oh, maybe Vivaldi. I'll go with Vivaldi. Vivaldi? That's, yeah. That's your final answer. Yeah, that's my final answer. <laughs> yeah. Four Seasons by Vivaldi is phenomenal. I've heard it at the TSO. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Mind you, I met Yo-Yo. Well, I didn't meet Yo-Yo Ma. I was there last year when they did the 100th anniversary and Yo-Yo Ma was playing. So it would be nice to actually meet him. Like, I mean, the first time I saw him was on Sesame Street as a kid. Right. So it would probably be neat to meet him too. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but I think Vivaldi it would have to be. Have you ever met a celebrity, a musical artist in the past? Not, no. No? No. I've met one in oh, my yeah. life. Who was that? It was Ken Casey of the Dropkick Murphys. Oh, really? He actually, uh, I was in, in Boston for, for a week, and he, he owned a bar in Boston called oh, yeah. McGreevy's. And he used to serve there from time to time. And I happened to go in there the one, one day. Actually, I went there every day that we were there. But uh, I stopped in one day, and he was actually working. And this guy had stories for, for days. He was, he was a phenomenal guy. Yeah. So he was definitely, I would definitely sit by him and listen to his stories all night by the fire pit. So. Yeah, that's cool. One of these is not like the other. <laughs> Sesame Street. Rock climbing, mountain biking, hiking, scuba diving, and Aikido. How long have you practiced martial arts? And what was the initial appeal to them? Oh, yeah. Um... Well, in my teens, I started doing jujitsu and then moved on to karate. And then as I've gotten older, I've gone back to Aikido. Um, you know, like growing up as a kid, I watched all the martial arts movies, right? And was fascinated by them. Right. Um, wanted to get into it. I went and tried a class out and got, kind of got hooked and did it for quite a few years. Um, jujitsu and, and karate and that. And then, you know. Start, you know, careers and moving away and family and that. And, and then, you know, I was, I didn't do it for a few years and I just needed to get more active and I got back into doing stuff. So I started doing a keto again and I had done it a little bit before, but that's what I do now. And I like, I love doing it. Yeah, I should try it. Yeah. I, I need to get more active. So, oh, it's a lot, ton of fun. Yeah. Oh yeah. A lot of good people there. Funny you mentioned about, uh, Kung Fu movies in, in the 80s. Yeah. You don't see a lot of them anymore. No, no. I used to That's... love watching. Like, I mean, you know, as a child in the 70s and the 80s, 
the kung fu movies that were badly overdubbed or right. the jean-claude van damme and chuck norris movies mm -hmm. actually i guess I guess I have met celebrities. I, I actually did a training session with, with Chuck Norris and with Bill Wallace. Really? Bill Wallace was one of the uh, the kickboxers or, or the original karate uh, fighters back in the day. So wow. I did a thing in the, in the would have been late 80s with them. It was a, a training session in Hamilton at Mohawk College. Oh, wow. So that's pretty Yeah, neat. that was kind of cool. I had pictures with the two of them. So from that, so huh. yeah. <laughs> I totally forgot about that. You're digging deep in like, my gray matter here. I guess so. <laughs> There's a young man or woman considering a career in the skilled trades right now. What advice do you have for them? Go for it. Right? Mm -hmm. um, there's lots of programs out there. You know, there's there's tool, um, what is it? Uh, there's helmets to hard hats, mm -hmm. right? For people coming from the military. There's um, boots in the trades. There's uh, co-ops through high schools, right? Go out there and try something, right? It may not be the trade you want, but it'll give you kind of an idea what the work is like. Um, you know, if you have friends that are in the trades or, you know, for your son, in your case, somebody in the trades that you can talk to, ask them about what kind of work they do and, and how they enjoy it. Um, if you can go work for a place part-time and just try it out, get an idea. Um, some, some of the... You know, the laborers hall and the bricklayers hall have pre-apprenticeship programs that you can take. And then typically after that, there's a paid placement where they start you out on a job site getting paid and you try it out. You know, doing anything like that where you can try something, right? A lot of high schools have construction um, programs and a lot of them have construction co-ops. The carpenters union has your last six months of high school. You can do a co-op with them and get your high school credits right. and training. So there's a lot of opportunities and they're getting more and more for young people or people in their 20s to go out and try trades there's you know opportunities to get money while you're doing it or collect ei um, if you need to if you, you know you've lost your job you need to take care of yourself or a family um, but there's opportunities to get people in the trades and get people to start right you know including you know opportunities for indigenous youth that are, are looking at a career outside of the band or the community um, you know, the IBW in town here does an indigenous program and it's almost like a pre-apprenticeship for the electrical union where they give them a whole bunch of training and then they've taken some of the kids on as apprentices. Um, IHSA does a indigenous ground person training course where they give them a whole bunch of training and, and they go to work at a utility as a ground person. And then from there, they can get a power line technician apprenticeship and become a lineman. Mm -hmm. So there's there's more and more opportunities. Sometimes you just need to ask somebody. Sometimes you need to know where to look. Um, the Employment Training Division of the Ministry of Labor, Immigration, Training, Skills, Development, they have they know about some of these opportunities. You can reach out to them and ask, right? We have OYAP programs. Besides co-ops through the high schools, we have OYAP program, which is Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Program, that is run for mature students or kids that are done their high school as an opportunity for them to get a co-op placement in a trade to see if they like a trade and try it out. And a lot of these programs, the kids in them, once they're done them, they have, they have a, an apprenticeship or a job afterwards, mm -hmm. if that's what they want. And it's a great opportunity. My son did the pre-apprenticeship program with the bricklayers unit and absolutely loved it. Mm -hmm. And he's a fourth year apprentice now. That's great. We're waiting for his last term of school so he can write. I'm so proud of him. Yeah, you should be. That's awesome. Oh, yeah. It's funny. You mentioned, um, you mentioned options for people that are, aren't currently in school. And I think a lot of people out there that aren't in school right now don't realize there are still opportunities out there that they can jump into a skilled trade through some of these programs that are out there. Yeah. Like, I mean, the, the trades are screaming for people. We're, we're so understaffed in the trades and a lot of employers are having a hard time finding people to fill positions. A hundred percent. And yeah. construction is still really busy and there's so much opportunity out there, you know, it doesn't hurt to ask and it doesn't hurt to see what your options are. And, and, you know, we see that too, when we've had downturns in the, in the factory areas, you know, down in St. Thomas or Talbotville with, with Ford and that where a lot of, a lot of the people that worked in those sectors have gone from there to construction, mm -hmm. right? There's opportunities in construction and the, some of the skills they had from those employers are transferable. Right. Right. You know, and they were able to get trades out of it or, 
you know, we see people that are out working on the tools on construction sites that end up getting into one of those factories into their maintenance departments, mm -hmm. right? If you want to be out on new sites all the time, great. But if you want to, you know, if you want to work at one place all the time too, it's, it can go back and forth. For sure. So it just doesn't mean, you know, just being on a job site, you could be in a permanent place on the maintenance staff at some point too. Mm -hmm. There's so much opportunity for the trades and, and I, I try to encourage as many kids as I can to do it because it's a great, it's a great way of life. It is. And there's endless pathways, which you highlighted there. We have yet to try the, the third round of, of butter tarts or tarts here, which is the butter tart. Yeah, the standard PK yeah, butter I'm, tart. I'm excited about this one. Yeah. I hope it turned well, out. Well, the bacon good. one was really good. Yeah, it was really nice. And finally, Dan, for the viewers at home today, I mentioned in my intro that trades are dangerous and trades are unsafe are stigmas that kind of surround uh, the trades, typically from people that don't work inside the trades are the ones saying this. And I'm wondering if you can tell the viewers at home whether this is true or not. It's a little bit of each, Nick. We look at it that in, in a construction environment, you might have workers that are exposed to fall hazards. So there is an element of danger. But if workers are wearing the personal protective equipment they need to be wearing, if they're following their training, it's just as safe as any other workplace. Right. Right. So if somebody's working at heights and they're working from a scaffold or on a work platform that has a guardrail around it, or if they're attached to a fall protection system, they're safe. Mm -hmm. It's when they unhook or when they're in that area where they're exposed to fall hazard and they're not protected by a guardrail or fall protection that it can become unsafe. Right. It's, it's no different than any other workplace. Otherwise, we have good workplaces and we have bad workplaces. Right. Predominantly, we have good workplaces. Mm -hmm. And if the employer is ensuring that workers are working safely and they're following the legislation and are aware of the hazards and wearing whatever PPE they need to be wearing to protect them from the hazards, it's just as safe as anywhere else. You know, we have history of, of you know, um, cashiers and grocery stores being asked to help stock a shelf and, and cutting themselves or falling and banging their head. You know, we have people in factories that get injured, you know, construction, we have people getting injured. There's, you know, each sector has people getting hurt. For sure. It's just, unfortunately, sometimes the construction ones are very much in the news. Right. So, and, and, you know, quite frankly, sometimes the news only reports on, on, on the bad things. Correct. So that comes to people's mind first off, but they don't talk about all of the hours that are worked without injuries. They don't, right. and some of it's hard for them to, to really give a value to, because you don't know, excuse me, how many, how many hours are worked for some of the sectors, you know, whether it's roofing or home renovation or construction, it's hard to determine how many hours are worked without an injury, mm -hmm. but they're able to collect the data for injuries. So sometimes, you know, it, it's hard to, to equate how many hours or how, how, what percentage of the work being done is done safely, but it's right. just as safe as any other workplace. Yeah. I guess if you're only looking at one part through that lens, you're only going to get that result that you want to see. It's time to look at the big picture and really help identify through that, through that, those, all those analytics, how safe these crews yeah, are. I don't know how many job sites I go to, particularly the bigger job sites where they have a board when you go into the job site and it tells you how many days they've had without a lost time injury, mm -hmm. right? There's lots of job sites that don't have any major injuries. You know, maybe the most major injury they have is somebody cutting their hand or hurting a finger. Right. And, and they build giant projects where nobody's been hurt, which is absolutely wonderful. And I, th I think it's it's not coincidence that a lot of these workplaces that you mentioned that have this kind of uh, job board or things like that or days without injury are typically the companies that have a really like, excellent safety culture in their company. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and that's and that's a whole thing which I even totally forgot to mention about internal responsibility system. The owner or the guy in charge needs to believe in it, mm -hmm. and it and it f goes downhill from the owner or the head manager of a workplace. Right. If they believe in safety, then they hire people that believe in safety. And then that trickles down to the workers. They teach the workers about working safe. 
They put in place all the PPE that workers need to have. They give them the training they need to have. They make them aware of the hazards and how not to get hurt. Mm -hmm. You know, that all goes together. And if the employer believes in, in safety and a safety culture, the workplace is safer. Absolutely. I've, I've been in those situations myself. I've worked at different companies and I've excelled in those, those companies that did have that culture. And companies that didn't have that culture, I didn't want to be a part of. That's well, and that's the whole thing. You know, a happy workplace or a happy environment is tied to how safe it is and how clean it is mm -hmm. and how much everybody takes ownership for issues and deals with them. Mm -hmm. And if the employer doesn't care about safety, it doesn't care about keeping the workplace clean, then, then you know, people get hurt and the site gets dirty and it gets harder and harder to do your job without worrying about tripping hazards and worrying about getting hurt yourself and it doesn't become enjoyable to work there. So they lose people. Right. And that's, you know, you, you touched on retention issues there and that's the, that's the biggest complaint I hear from people about why they move on is I don't like the setting that I'm in. Yes. And I want to be in a setting, in a setting where I'm protected well, and exactly. I feel valued. So right. yeah. it makes total sense. And remember friends, start hungry, stay handy. We'll catch you in the next one.